with us as we hear from your word through Todd. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning's scripture reading is found in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Again, that's Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Let us hear the word of the Lord. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mind that is set on the flesh is death, but the mind that is set on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile toward God, and it does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from So give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Taylor. I am incredibly excited about today's passage. Um, this is a life change. It is, um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to have fun this morning. So hopefully this will be good for you too. Um, I also love the hymn that we sang. And there's that line, let all things their creator bless. And I am struck that that is a very good prayer right now because we're looking at a world we're looking at a country where it seems like there's a lot of people a lot in creation that is not blessing their creator and um and that grieves me and that absolutely grieves me uh, i think right now every one of us is deeply disturbed by what we saw happen to uh george floyd a man who was um originally from Houston, actually was involved in ministry in Houston and was in Minneapolis as part of a discipleship program. Um, and we are disturbed by what we are seeing with rioting, with what we are seeing with um, just the way people are responding to that situation. And I would like to take a second and pray. Uh, I think that is appropriate. Um, a lot of hurting people of this. Heavenly Father, um, we sit here in Longview, Texas, largely unaffected by so much of what is happening in the rest of this country. Um, we have not seen riots here. We've not seen buildings destroyed or burned. But Lord, our hearts break. Uh, our hearts break because um, people have been mistreated. Uh, a, a man that 
we have, I have never met, I suspect most of us have never met, was mistreated. And he was one of your followers, and we grieve over that, Lord. And we grieve over the fact that there are so many people who are uh, experiencing extraordinary loss. There are so many people who are looking for answers, who are reaching out and trying to say this is wrong, and they don't know how to do it, um, and they don't know where to go with their anger. And so, Lord, what we pray is that you would manifest justice and mercy, that you would manifest holiness and grace, that you would manifest righteousness and love all together because all of us need all of those things and our country needs all of those things in deep measure right now. Lord, as we sit here relatively isolated from this, we recognize that we are not isolated from the underlying problems. There are underlying problems of injustice. There are underlying problems of not knowing what to do with our anger and frustration and deep disappointments. And Lord, um, we all have opportunities to step into those things in the lives of people around us. Give us the boldness to do that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think one of the challenges of this situation is just the range of responses that people have. And so I'm going to ask you a question. Please... Please, please do not answer this out loud. It could start a fight, which might make it interesting on Facebook, but um, let's not do that. And here's my question for you. What comes to your mind when you think about this situation that's developing? with George Floyd, the rioters, the protesting? Kind of what just automatically pops into your head. Part of the challenges that we're facing as a nation is what automatically pops into people's head is a huge range of responses. There are some people who um, are extremely angry, even to the point of hatred, towards the authorities. There are some who are extremely angry, even even to the point of hatred, towards those who are angry at the authorities. There's an extreme range of opinion about who is in the wrong. And so we as Christians, even as a distant, need to answer the question for ourselves, how are we supposed to think about this? What should come to our mind as we think about a situation like this? And as we move into Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, I want us to keep that question in the back of our minds because I'm going to apply it today's passage. And I think today's passage is going to help us work through that. So what we're going to do with Romans 8, 1 through 11, is we're going to walk through the passage fairly quickly, and we're going to look really just at the whole passage, and then we're going to pull out two key principles that are very important, principles that have been life-changing for me. And then I want to apply the second of those principles to the question of how do we think about what's going on in our country right now? But to understand today's passage, let's take a quick look back at last week to remember what we talked about. And and you might remember that we kind of compared our lives to a forest. And what we said was that the forest is kind of like that corrupting influence of sin that is at work in our lives. But, But what the Holy Spirit does, if we're a Christian, is he comes in and he starts bringing clearings into our lives. And over time, as as the Holy Spirit grows us and matures us, those clearings become larger and that corrupting influence of sin gets weeded out more and more in our lives. And that's a lifetime process. And Paul's point here in Romans chapter 7 was that corruption doesn't influence us, or corruption doesn't control us, but it does influence us. And it influences us very powerfully And that influence is dealt with by the Holy Spirit over time. And you'll remember this chart from last week as well. We said, this is not all of it, but some of the things that the corrupting influences can look like. 
Uh, they can be a self-focus. They can, it can be us giving into fear, us, us diving into conflict in unhealthy ways and, and impatience or cruelty. And we also said what the Holy Spirit is doing is not just weeding these things out. He's also in the process of replacing them with something that reflects his character. And what we used in this case was Galatians chapter 5 in the fruit of the Spirit from the letter that Paul wrote to Galatians. And so we just talked about that, that the Holy Spirit is in the process of replacing corrupt influ- impulses like these with influences of the Spirit. And then we left ourselves with this dangling question last time that I said we'd be answering this morning. And that question was, what is our role in that process? And Paul's going to answer that question. And Paul answers that question in light of a bigger question. And the bigger question is, well, if I've got these corrupting influences in my life, if I'm still struggling with the influence of sin, what must God think of me? That's the question that he's going to answer. And as he answers that question, he's going to also address how it is that we participate with the Holy Spirit in widening the clearings, removing those corrupting influences that move us towards sin. And he's going to answer the question of what God thinks of us in three different paragraphs in today's passage that Taylor read read for us. The first paragraph, verses 1 through 4, he's he's going to immediately state how God thinks of us. Then in the next paragraph, verses 5 through 8, he's, he's going to address how we think of God. And then in the last paragraph, verses 9 through 11, he's going to address how we think of ourselves. But he starts with what God thinks of us. And the answer is really clear. There is no condemnation. That's what he says right up front in verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for who? For those who are in Christ Jesus. Who is that? That is anyone who is a follower of Christ. That is anyone who has put their trust, who believe in Christ, what he did on the cross. If that is you, you are in Christ. And God looks at you and says, guilty. You have no condemnation from God. Verses two through four explain why there is no condemnation from God. Verse two says that the spirit Or as some translations say, the life-giving spirit has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. So the spirit has come in and he's given life where the law gave sin and the law gave death. How does that happen? Why is that possible? For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. What's he talking about there? Remember, we've talked Uh, back in chapter 6, that if we have this corrupting influence in our lives, what happens when we see God's standard of what's right and wrong? That corrupting influence in our lives looks at that standard and responds to it exactly the way we respond every time we see a sign that says, wet paint, do not touch. We just smear ourselves all over that wet paint just because we can't resist that temptation. And Paul has said, that's exactly what happened when the law came in, when God's standard of right and wrong was made clear. That corruption inside of us just took that and just launched us into doing what was wrong. And Paul is saying in verse 3 that what the law couldn't do because sin just used it as an excuse for doing wrong, God accomplished By sending his son. What does it mean in the likeness of sinful flesh? It means he sent him as totally, completely human. And he did it for the purpose of addressing sin. And what he did is instead of condemning us, he actually condemned sin. So here's what he's saying in verse 3. Is that Jesus took that full penalty, the guilt everything that was due to us, and he took it on himself. And the result is that sin is called guilty. And we are declared not guilty. Why did he do that? What was the outcome? This is extraordinary. In order that the righteous requirement of the law 
might be fulfilled in us. What does that be? Well, in another letter, Paul is actually going to explain uh, what he means is that Christ's righteousness gets applied to us. So when God looks at us, he sees Christ. He sees the perfect life, life that Christ lived. But I think there's also something else that's going on here. I think he's also saying that now we have the ability that we didn't have before to do what is right, to respond to the law in a way that says, this is what God wants. This is what it means to live out God's desires. And now we can look at that and say, yes, and we are not automatically controlled by sin. Here's the point of the paragraph that Paul has just given us. God does not condemn the person who is in Christ. And that is because every basis of condemnation has been removed by being in Christ. The guilt, the penalty that, that was a basis of condemnation has been taken on by Christ. The righteous requirements have been met. And so what does God think of you as you struggle with sin's influence in your life? The answer is God looks at you and says, not guilty. And then verse 4 makes this extraordinary statement that, that we fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. How is that possible? Explains that next when he talks about what is it that we think about God in verses 5 through 8. And really, there are two different ways that Paul identifies thinking about God. There's the flesh versus the spirit. Two different types of people that talk, Paul talks about. For those who live according to their flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. This set their minds is translated in some of your translations as their outlook. It refers to kind of where does your mind naturally go? What do you naturally think of? When your mind's at rest, where does your mind go? What are the inclinations of your thinking? And so there are two types of people, those who live according to the corrupting influences that are at work within you. They set their minds, their outlook, their mind is naturally oriented towards those corrupting influences. But those who live according to the spirit, their outlook is on things of the spirit. The result of that is in verse 6. For the mind set on the flesh, the result is death. But for the mind set on the spirit, the result is life and peace. And why the mind controlled by sin leads to death is answered in verses 7 and 8. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. That word hostile has the idea of being, being angry with God, being against God. Even it's, it can be as strong as hating God. The mind, the mind whose outlook is set on the corrupting influences of sin within us, that mind is hostile, even hates God. And because of that, it does not submit to God's law. In fact, it cannot submit to God's law. Think about the power of what that's saying. That is saying that if that is your thinking, then you are someone who absolutely does not want to think or does not want to submit to God's law. But you know what? Even if you did want to submit to God's law, you couldn't. And you know what? Even if you could, you wouldn't because you don't want to. That's the person that's being described here. And because of that, that person, the person who is controlled by the sinful corruption, cannot please God. So let's go back to our favorite chart. The mind of the person who's controlled by sin's influences, whose outlook is controlled by sin, instinctively, is going to move in these directions in their thinking. Maybe not all of them, but, but you'll recognize some of them. They'll be, they're just instinctively are going to put themselves at the center. They're instinctively going to be self-protective. Look at how they're going to relate to people. They will instinctively be in, in conflict with them or, or move towards conflict, be impatient with people, give up on people, even be cruel or harsh. 
There'll be people whose, whose mind, whose outlook will immediately move them towards being out of control or rebellious. But the mind of the person who lives by the Spirit is going to naturally flow in a very different direction. They're going to flow towards being loving, joyous, peaceful, and so on. The mind of the person who lives by the Spirit is going to naturally flow not towards hostility with God. It's going to flow towards the things of the Spirit, which works itself out in a life of righteousness. This is what I think is going to be incredibly practical to us, but I want to come back to it after we finish examining the rest of the passage. Paul concludes by what we are to think of ourselves, and and that is that we are alive. Remember, the Spirit is described as a life-giving Spirit in in verses 1 through 4. And so in verse 9, what he says is that you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if. Now, this if throws us off. Notice that there's an if in each one of those. See, the the point of Paul's making in this passage is to reassure us that we are in the group that's not condemned. So why does he have these three ifs there? Because when we read that, it's really natural for us to think, well, he's setting up a condition here that we may or may not meet. And maybe we should be worried. Well, in the Greek, that's actually not what he's doing. What he's doing is to, he's inviting us to examine, to think about the implications of what is true. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, you could, you could read that. Because the Spirit of God dwells in you, you are not in the flesh. But if you do not have the Spirit of Christ in you, or if that does not belong to him, if, if anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So what's the dividing line between the person who is, who is not condemned Versus the person who is condemned. It's whether or not they have the spirit. Now let me break down the the verses in a little bit more detail. Verse 10. The point is that there's still corruption in you. But if in Christ. But if Christ is in you. Although the body is dead. There's still corruption in you. You're still part of you. that, That is under the influence of the corrupting power of sin. The spirit of life is in you and at work giving you righteousness. See, you have life you have re- because you have received the righteousness of God. And that moves you from death to life. The righteousness of Christ has been applied to you. And because of that, you are no longer controlled by sin and under the body of death. And verse 11 looks to the future. We still have that corrupting influence in us. But the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. So what are the implications of that? He who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. That part of you that is still under the power and influence of of corruption of sin will one day be completely characterized by life. What Paul is doing in these verses is assuring us of which camp we are in. And what I'd like to do is ask you this question. Why is it that you think you are not condemned by God? What's the sign in your life that you could point to and say, I am not condemned by God? For most of my life, the way I would have answered that question is when I was six years old, I prayed and received Jesus into my heart with my mom in Willows, California. It's fine. Nothing wrong with that answer. I just want to point out that that's not how Paul answers his question. How does Paul answer the question? It's the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's how Paul answers the question. That's really important. Nothing wrong with the answer that I had for most of my life. But there's something really, really powerful in being able to say the Holy Spirit is at work in you right now. 
And you can identify that and you can see that. And that is your assurance today that you are not condemned. It's not that you're going to be perfect, but the Holy Spirit is at work widening those clearings. And I would encourage you, make it a part of how you interact with your children, your friends, your family, your fellow Christians, to point out how the Holy Spirit is at work and make the connection for them. This is how you know that the Spirit dwells in you and there is no condemnation. We must reaffirm this in one another. Saw a um, something extraordinary on Facebook. It's been kind of harsh on Facebook, but this is something extraordinarily good. I noticed that there were a group of FBCers who started a discussion about worship music. Um, think about how ironic this is, but there are probably few things in the church as dividing as worship. That should cause pause and reflection. Um, but it's true. It's absolutely true. And I saw these FBCers into this, enter into this conversation about worship that was absolutely inviting, pleading, begging subject matter for let's lean into the corrupting influences within us. And what I saw was a group of people, many of whom, and you know who I'm talking about, those of you, who have extremely strong opinions on everything, enter this conversation with grace, humility, and a willingness to learn. And what I should have done and didn't do is I should have used that as a reason, as an opportunity to say, do you see what is happening here? This is the Holy Spirit at work in you. And this is one of the things you point to and say, how do I know I am not condemned? I am not condemned because the Holy Spirit is at work. We continue to struggle with sin. That was the point of chapter 7. But Paul assures us that there are signs that the Holy Spirit is changing us. And that is all the proof that we need that God declares you not guilty. So how does this help us today? How does this help us practically today? I want to identify two principles that I think if we can really internalize these two principles, they will change your life. The first principle is this. Respond to sin with sorrow, not with guilt or shame. Very often what happens, Satan will use half-truths to destroy us. And so Satan will do something like we give in to lust or we blow it on Facebook and rip someone apart or we gossip about someone. And Satan immediately just kind of pops up and says, you blew it. You must be so ashamed of yourself. Look how guilty you are. God must look at you and just reject you. The problem with that message is that it's partially true. You did blow it. The other problem with that message or the real problem with that message, is that it's mostly false. God does not look at you, and he is not ashamed of you, and he does not reject you. God looks at you and says, there is no condemnation. When we enter into guilt and shame, what we do is we basically say, 
I condemn myself where God does not. There is a biblical response to sin. And it is God's response to sin in our lives. And it is the response of sorrow. It is the response of grief. It is the response of someone who looks at what we have done and said, I have broken the heart of the one who loves me like no one has ever loved me or ever will love me. I have rejected what is valuable to the one who loves me like no one has ever loved me or ever will love me. And that should produce grief and sorrow, not self-condemnation. And I lived most of my life in grief and shame, or in, in guilt and shame over everything I did. And every time I sinned, I would just crucify myself. And the problem is someone was already crucified for me. And that's Paul's point. But God looks at us. He says, not guilty. There's a second principle. We widen the clearings by rerouting your mind, rerouting our thinking. The Holy Spirit does the work, but we play a part. And I have to say that this is something I really struggle with. I am not speaking as someone who has this down. I am speaking as someone who is very much in process and is a struggler in the process. But what I find is that I make most progress in this area when I'm able to slow down and pay attention to how am I thinking and catch myself when I start thinking as if I am in the flesh. For me, the best place to always come back and start this, me personally, is when I get into bed at night because my mind starts to go to rest. And what I try to do is pay attention. Where does my mind go? Where does it wander off to? Sometimes I replay a conversation that I had earlier in the day, and I think about all the things that I wish I would have said to put that person in their place. Sometimes I think about the things that I'm worried about and I start going through plan A and plan B and plan, you know, I, you know sometime around plan Q, I realize what I'm doing. I, I am being dominated by fear. And in those moments, I try to catch myself and change what I'm thinking about. And I try to shift my thinking to one of three things. And sometimes, like last night, I did all three. I'll try to shift my thinking and, and focus on a passage of Scripture that relates. And last night, I was thinking about this passage. I might think about an aspect of the character of Christ. And, and I just was feeling unsettled last night. I was feeling discontent would really be the right word. And, and, and so for me, I had to think about the, the love that I have in Christ is basis for me to be content no matter what comes into my life. And then I had to think about the fruit of the Spirit and how that applies. And so for me, what I thought about was joy. What does it mean for me to have joy in this moment? It, it means that no matter what comes into my life, I know that God is at work for my good and for my best. And the more that I make this a discipline and a habit that I do at night, the more I catch myself and reroute my thinking during the day. And, and I did it this morning on the way here. I found myself just getting frustrated with something and I had to catch myself and say, I'm not responding in a right way. Let's reroute my thinking. And in this case, towards the fruit of the spirit, towards an issue of peace. So we're going to practice. Right here, right now. This is lab work. I asked you earlier, what is it that comes to your mind when you think about the situation with George Floyd? Well, I want to see what it would be like to sort of reroute our thinking. 
What does it mean, listen carefully to how I say this, for your thinking to reflect love in this situation? Right, what's easy for us to do is to say, this is how they need to be loving. How do you need to be loving in this situation? And you say, well, wait a minute, I don't know these people. I don't go anywhere near Minnesota. I don't like Minnesota. There's snow there. They like the Vikings. I don't want nothing to do with Minnesota. Well, love for us in a situation means what do we want for the people who... Do you pray for them? How do you pray for them? Do we pray that everyone involved will experience the justice and the mercy of God? Do we pray that everyone involved will come to know the God who loves them? I think for us, as we think on that and we integrate that into our lives, we start rerouting our thinking about this situation. Think about peace. That's a big one. Remember, peace is not the absence of conflict. That's not the biblical definition of peace. The biblical definition of peace is thriving. It's like the presence of justice. Be mindful of what flourishing oh and let's bring this home let's not talk about how we really want to see the police in Minnesota flourish if when you are pulled over for speeding you treat them rudely Let's not talk about how we want to see racial justice in Minnesota if we are blind to the inequalities and injustices that take place right in our back. What does it mean to have the outlook, the mindset of the spirit? Part of it is saying, what does it mean? For there to be peace. Let me think about and participate in what it means for there to be peace in my own backyard. Whatever comes to mind when you think about George Floyd, rioting, demonstrations, run it through this grid. How does your thinking reflect love and joy and peace and patience? to look at everyone involved in this and say to every one of them, you are in Christ and therefore you are not condemned. And that's a good place for us to start our prayers. That they would know the, they would know the God who wants to look at them and say, you are not condemned. Well, that starts with us. Paul's point in this passage is that the person in Christ is not contempt. respond 
Again, each week we encourage you to rewrite the passage in your own words. I don't want to give you an easy out, but if you haven't been doing this, at least do verses 1 through 4. At least do verses 1 through 4. Memorize verse 1. It's short. But if you can get these truths hardwired into your life, I promise you it will be life-changing. I encourage you to practice. Track. I picked that just as a good starting point. Maybe there's a night isn't the right time for you, but for me, it's a good starting point to pay attention to where, where, where does my mind go? What is my what is the natural outlook outset of my mind ask the holy spirit for the ability to reroute your thinking single most life-changing truth I promise you that you are going to hear all day and I don't care if you've been a Christian for me I've been a Christian for 47 years I need to hear that truth every day there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus would you join me in praying that that truth gets driven deeper into our hearts every day. Father, we come before you completely dependent upon your spirit to clear away the corrupting influences that are in our lives. And yet, Lord, we recognize that we do have a role to play and that role, as, as you showed us in today's passage, is in rerouting our thinking is, is in rerouting our thinking so it is directed towards Christ, so it is directed towards the things And yet, not guilty. The full guilt was poured out on Christ, was taken on by Christ. By, by embracing shame, Lord, let us instead be people who respond to our, our sin with the sorrow that you feel and the thankfulness of forgiveness. And Lord, we ask for your help with that even today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to have a prayer team. Um, we did to settle this time and where that prayer team was going to be, but uh, Wayne Allred had a great idea. So this is Wayne's fault. Um, actually, it's Wayne's idea. Why don't we have the prayer team kind of meet over by the desk that's to my right? Wayne, does that work for you? Okay. I think it's just easier to find than trying to meet outside. Um, and we still should be out of the way of people who are uh, trying to clean. We do ask that you 
thank you for being here. For those online, thank you for being a part of this online. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful and safe week. You guys are dismissed.